What if I told you that by correctly interpreting a poem, you could have been very rich? I know some of you high school English poetry lovers are probably groaning right now and thinking, well, it's poverty ahead. But no, I'm serious. I'm giving you the real goods. Hidden within this poem are clues to a hidden treasure worth over a million dollars. So if you poetry geniuses are ready, here's the poem. As I have gone alone in there, and with my treasures bold, I can keep my secret where and hint of riches new and old. Begin it where warm waters halt, and take it in the canyon down, not far, but too far to walk, put in below the home of Brown. From there it's no place for the meek, the end is drawing ever nigh, there'll be no paddle up your creek, just heavy loads and water high. If you've been wise and found the blaze, look quickly down your quest to cease. But tarry scant with marvel gaze. You just take the chest and go in peace. So why is it that I must go and leave my trove for all to seek? The answer, I already know. I've done it tired, and now I'm weak. So hear me all and listen good. Your effort will be worth the cold. If you are brave and in the wood... I'll give you title to the gold. Nine clues hidden within this poem to a treasure chest containing s around a million dollars worth of gold and hidden somewhere in the Rockies. It sparked a modern-day, 10-year-long treasure hunt until it was found. Somewhere deep in the mountains north of Santa Fe, an 11th century treasure box filled with millions worth of gold, emeralds, and antiquities has finally been found. And online, a community of treasure hunters is going wild. The unfindable has been found. Forrest Finn is an 89-year-old art collector who stashed the treasure more than 10 years ago in an effort to get people off their couches and into the great outdoors. Now telling me over the phone, a man from back east has finally deciphered the secret clues he left in a poem. From there, it's no place for the meek. The end is ever drawing nigh. But so far, Forrest has been mum on the man's identity, saying he learned the search was over when the man emailed him a picture of the treasure and in a post describing the secret location under a canopy of stars in the lush forested vegetation of the Rocky Mountains. The discovery coming after years of hundreds of thousands of people trying to find the chest that for me started as a local reporter nearly a decade ago in Santa Fe as one of the first to cover the modern day treasure hunt. Since then, thousands have shared their own quests, like Ray and Chloe Harp, who say it's brought them closer as a family. It's brought us together out in nature, out in sunshine. I mean, I think that was what Forrest wanted, and it gave us a perspective of, of the world that our children will never forget. And Today, hearing the news is bittersweet. It yeah. feels like the last page of our favorite book. <laughs> but the story hasn't been without significant danger. There have been countless rescues and at least five people have died while searching in treacherous terrain. Authorities long urging Finn to call off the search, despite Finn's insistence the treasure was hidden in a spot that a 70-year-old man would be able to reach. But today, that exact location, still a mystery. Finn saying the treasure hunter wishes to remain anonymous, and now it's his secret to keep. Epic, right? Tantalizing? Make you want to just go for it? Calling many, uh, you know, would-be Indiana Jones types out on a great quest into a seeking with a faint possibility of finding something valuable, something grand, something hidden. I remember it was a few years ago that my sister-in-law, Jody, sent me this, an article on this man, Forrest, and, and his treasure trove that was hidden, and I think she thought I should abandon all reason and go and find it. Anyway, it's a quest that people took up with all seriousness, some even costing them their life. Well, we're on a quest, too, as a church, as a people, a quest for all those who are themselves questing. A questing that is rooted deep in our hearts as it is rooted in the heart of God himself. Well, we're beginning a new series on the purpose of our church. A few times a year, we try to do that, kind of take a step back and 
look again, refocus ourselves on what it means for us to be the church. What is our focus as followers of Jesus? There's a lot of ways that that can be described, simple terms, evangelism, uh, discipleship, uh, mission, outreach, service, growth. As the Erickson Covenant Church, we've captured all of that in a simple statement that we help people find and follow Jesus. And we've been using this short statement for a few years now. It's a good one. It's simple. It's an active phrase. It's memorable. However, as I've been praying and reflecting, as I've been leading and, and loving and, and working with the church and with the community, this sense of who we are has been deepened. And for a few years now, I've been wrestling with how do we put a little more flesh on that basic mission of helping people find and follow Jesus. And so for the next few weeks, we're just going to take a deeper dive on our mission as a church, and we're going to do it week by week, looking at this slightly fuller statement, that our mission as the Erickson Covenant Church is to help people find and follow Jesus so they flourish in Christ and fulfill his mission to the world. Find, follow, flourish, and fulfill. Today, we're going to dive into what it means for us to help people find Jesus. And to do that, we need to get first things first. We can only help people find Jesus because we have a God who's committed to finding people first. That's where we start. We serve a seeking, finding God. Our God is himself a seeker, a quester, a God who's on a mission to find people. It's very remarkable that the very first question in the whole of the Bible is from God himself. And it is a seeking question. Where are you? God asks. He calls it out into the garden as he's trying to find the now suddenly elusive humans. Humans that, it turns out, had broken trust with God and had fallen into shame and ruin. Where are you? God asks. And that cry from the heart of God continues as God seeks to find and restore every cringing, hiding, shame-filled, sin-broken human. Our God is a seeking and finding God. And the story of Genesis and then on into the history of Abraham and his family and down through the story, it's the story of God who is seeking and finding God. People, lost people, broken people. And all of that seeking and finding culminates in the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus who came as the seeking, finding God in the flesh. Jesus actually said that this was the reason why he came. He expressed that in a lot of different ways. He showed it in his example. He demonstrated it in his teaching. He, he told it in different ways in his parables. But never was he more clear than the time he defended the restoration of Zacchaeus, that corrupt tax man, in Luke 19. In response to the pushback he got, particularly from religious people, as well as witnessing Zacchaeus' own response and repentance, Jesus stated his mission clearly. He said, the Son of Man, that was a favorite term Jesus used to refer to himself, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Why is it so important that we start here? Because we cannot talk about our mission to help people find Jesus without an understanding that the mission of God through Jesus Christ is to find people, that this is the mission of God that we are on, that we serve a seeking, finding God, and all of our help for people is so that they find the one who's been looking for them all along. So that's first. We serve a seeking, finding God. Second, we serve in a seeking but not yet finding world. 
the quest we see is real. Everyone is looking in one way or another, questing out for the real, for the true, for the satisfying, for the center, looking for meaning and fulfillment and doing it in ways that actually lead them more deeply into idolatry and slavery and destruction. And that's the story of the world, the story of religion. It's the story of our lives that we seek and seek and seek and seek, but we do not find. And that's the world that God loves. And that's the world in which we serve. And we've got to see that for what it is. Because this quest is true for our closest friends. It's true for our weirdest family members. (laughs) It's true for a fun workmate and an irritating workmate. It's true for our goofy school friends. It's true for our standoffish neighbors. It's true for all of them that everyone is in some way seeking life. But finding it, that's another story. The Apostle Paul had an experience in the Greek city of Athens, which helps us, I think, understand how it is that we help people find Jesus. How it is that we serve in a seeking but not yet finding world. Paul was on a bit of a layover in Athens. He wasn't there for a missionary purpose. He was there waiting for some friends to show up so that he could move on. But as he was waiting, his heart was caught by this seeking but not yet finding city of Athens. And he did what followers of Jesus can't help themselves but do. He started talking with these seekers about the God who was seeking them. The story is found in Acts 17, and if you'll allow me, I just want to read it for us. It's a beautiful story. So Acts 17, beginning in verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them, that's his friends, in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with them. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to the meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you were ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made with human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this. Listen to this. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design or skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. 
He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. It's a great story. I love it. I love what it shows us about how we can help people find Jesus. You see, Paul, here in Athens, he knows that he is serving a seeking, finding God in a world that is seeking, but not finding him. Well, to fully explore this, there's a little bit in here I'd like to unpack. Let's move on to my third point, the third point about our mission, and then I'll try to bring it together using Acts 17. The third truth we've already seen in Paul, and that is this. We serve as a seeking, finding church. If you tie it all together, this is how it reads. We serve our seeking, finding God in a seeking but not yet finding world as a seeking, finding church. I want to offer you a little quick workshop, as it were, kind of a, just a little help maybe, based on the clues we saw from Paul's visit here in Athens. How do we actually help people find Jesus? At least four things stand out in this story. The first is that we tune our hearts to the seeking, finding God. You know, Paul was deeply aligned with the heart of God for the world. I mean, that, that's really all he was about. He's deeply tuned to the Spirit's voice. And even though he was in Athens not really on purpose, there was a sense in which because he was so in tune with the heart of God that he looked around and the heart of God in Paul was caught with the city that he saw. And what it reveals to us is that as our hearts are tuned to God's heart, as we tune in, as we listen to the Spirit, as we are deeply immersed in Scripture, we will know the will and the heart of God the Father. We'll be tuned to His seeking, finding heart. As He quests for a lost creation, as He desires reunion with broken people, that God's mission will get down deep inside of us. And His questing cry, where are you? That'll be in us too. We tune our hearts to the seeking God. We do that through spiritual formation practices, by readying ourselves, by regularly connecting with God, by just living in alignment with his will and his heart. And that is where it starts. We tune our hearts to the seeking God. But second, we also tune our hearts to the seeking world. And this is very, very important. It's kind of like We walk through the world with stereo headphones where there's one sound coming in one ear and a different kind of sound coming in the other ear. We have the heart of God thrumming in one ear, forming us deeply. But in the other ear, we hear the dissonant beats of a world that is on a quest as well. And we're tuned in to both. And as a result of our tuning into the heart of God and being in tune with the world's cries, It's like we begin to see the seeking that is happening around us with new, fresh eyes. We begin to see the search culturally, among friends, through the arts. We're not only able to interpret the the mundane things, but the beautiful things and the broken things around us. To be able to help see the distractions for what they are. Even the crazy, wrong-headed, sinful things, we're able to interpret them as the quest of a seeking but not yet finding world. And the result is the result we see in Paul, that compassionate distress he has. Compassionate distress because he's so tuned into the heart of God and he's so tuned into the seeking world that he's able to see these idols and respond with compassionate distress, which is a different response than kind of a judgmental disdain. You know what I mean? The world has had enough judgmental disdain from Christians. What they need is us to get compassionately distressed. Compassionately distressed 
over their various quests that are ultimately leading them further into slavery and closer to death. We become compassionately distressed when we're tuned to the heart of God and we're tuned to the seeking world. Third, led by the Holy Spirit, led by this stereo tuning, we then can take those opportunities that are presented to us to point people to God's generous care and his incredible closeness. There's a lot we could unpack, and we're not going to today. But when you see Paul engage with the people of Athens, what he's essentially doing is he's saying, look, there's a God who loves you. There's a God who set the world up because he wants you to find him. And guess what, people? He's very, very close to you. He's trying to leverage those cultural poets. He's trying to leverage creation. He's trying to leverage their own rationale. He's he's connecting on various levels and trying to just help them see that there's a generous, loving God who is after them, who is close to them, who wants to give them everything so that they can live. And he's done everything he can through Jesus. He takes that opportunity, and we, led by the Spirit of God, can do the same. Which leads us to the fourth thing which is very simply, as we do that, as we live our lives out in front of people, as we point people to Jesus in the ways that we can, that we simply invite further connection and conversation for those who are open to it. There are those at the end of the story who sneer, but there are also those who say, we want to hear more. And then there are those who start following Jesus. Friends, we serve as a seeking, finding church. We help people find the God who's been seeking them so that they find not only the one their heart has truly been seeking for, but they find the one who's not far off at all and, in fact, has been so close to them they would hardly even believe it. Surrounded by seekers, we can help people see that what they're looking for is ultimately found in Jesus. But when I say that we serve as a seeking, finding church, I run the risk that you might misunderstand me and think that I'm referring to an evangelism event or a specific program that we offer as a church organizationally. Programs such as Alpha or maybe a special banquet. But that's not what I mean. Being a seeking, finding church Helping people find Jesus isn't a program thing. It's a people thing. It's an us thing. It's a personal responsibility that each one of us have. It's a mission that we've been given as God's people. Helping people find Jesus is actually about our life in the neighborhood. It's about our connection in the businesses. It's about our presence in schools. It's about the communities and neighborhoods in which we live and work and serve and love. That we tune our hearts to the stereo sounds of our seeking, finding God and our world's failed questing for something that was satisfied, that as we tune to that, it's not a program we're offering. We're offering ourselves. We're offering Jesus. That's the mission He's called us to fulfill. This came home to us with real force over the last couple years, didn't it? Because of COVID, all our programs were mostly stopped, except maybe a few things that we could offer online. But did that stop us from helping people find Jesus too? Well, it was challenging, wasn't it? We had to really, we had to really work that through what we began to realize more and more is that helping people find Jesus wasn't just something that we expect the church to do organizationally. Not something the church does just, you know, as as though the church is something out there that does it for us. Rather, there was a calling with this, an opportunity within this to embrace our calling to be the church that helps people find Jesus wherever we find ourselves. And so I want you to hear me very clearly. We are called to be a seeking, finding church every day of the week, wherever we are, as we serve, as we engage, as we connect and love, as we serve our seeking, finding God in our seeking but not yet finding world wherever we are. 
Rich Velotis recently said that the best witness we can offer as a church is not our programs, but our transformed lives in Christ. That's really, really true. Now, to counterbalance that slightly, I wanted to say that as we are able, we will organizationally offer specific programs that help, such as Alpha. And you know that we're Alpha fans. These programs essentially help us help people find Jesus. But even as we're offering those programs, mostly what we're going to be doing is just being the church that helps people find Jesus. And the fact of the matter is, a program like Alpha only really works when we're being the church out there anyway. We will also continue to be a church that makes sure that our gathered times, our times here online, our our times in our live services, where we're teaching, whether we're worshiping, that they're actually helpful to people who are themselves seeking, who are exploring faith. And that might be you today, and the Erickson Covenant Church might be a place that you've just been exploring faith, and you need to know that we're committed to trying to help you do that, trying to explain what's going on. Uh, We want to be the kind of church that does uh, pay attention to the process, the spiritual journey that people are on. But even as we do that, mostly we want to be a people who are attentive to the spiritual journeys of those who are around us, not just in our services. We serve as a seeking, binding church. Well, what do we do with this? We help people find Jesus. Well, here's how I'd like to close. I'd like to invite you to actually make a decision, particularly if you call the Erickson Covenant Church your home, if you are a committed follower of Jesus. Very simply, I'd like to just take a moment, and if you're ready, I'd like us to commit to to doing that, to commit to doing what we can in our own way, in our own families, in our own neighborhoods, in our own simple way, as we live with the gifts that we have to help people find Jesus. That's not meant to be a a weird burden that twists you out of shape. It's actually meant to free us to simply live life with others as we tune our lives to the heart of God. And so I just want to ask you, even now, to prayerfully say yes to that. Say yes to being that kind of a church, being that kind of follower of Jesus. And so I just want to give a space for a moment for you to consider that, and then I want to pray a prayer of blessing for you and for us. Lord Jesus, it is a privilege to help people find you. And for each one of us who who want that, who are willing to say yes to that, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would lead us Help us to tune our hearts to your heart. But also, would you help us tune our hearts to the world around us, our friends and our neighbors? Would you, by the Holy Spirit, put these stereo headphones on us so that we can hear your heart beating for this world, but we also can hear the cries of a world that's questing for life? Lord Jesus, today, We simply want to say yes to you and ask that you would lead us to help people find you. May your spirit fill us and lead us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, Jesus told a number of stories, parables and such, all about lost and found treasures. Stories that were told to illustrate the heart of our seeking, finding God and his mission to bring humans home. And Jesus, we discover, is the ultimate treasure seeker. He he came here to find you, to find him and her, us, to restore his broken creation. You know, one of the tragic elements of this Rocky Mountain treasure story 
the, you know, the treasure that was just found in 2020 was the five lives that were lost looking for it. And I don't want to minimize that tragedy at all. But let me say this. The reality is people are losing their lives every day on a quest for something valuable, something that will give them life, something that will give them meaning, something that will not satisfy them if they were to find it. And we've got to help them. We've got to help them discover that there's a God who's looking for them, that that is where life comes from. But you know what? Jesus himself lost his life looking for those same people too. And his quest was important enough. People were important enough to him that he would offer his very life in order to seek and to save, to go after them, to bring them home. And he succeeded. And he continues to succeed, to seek, to find, to find and restore every man, woman, and child, you, me, and here's the call. Let's be with him on his mission. Let's be a church that joins in his search for a treasure that is greater than gold. It's worth everything he could give. And it's worth everything that we can give to. Our mission as the Erickson Covenant Church is to help people find and follow Jesus so they flourish in Christ and fulfill his mission to the world. Next week, we'll explore what it means to help people follow Jesus.